Hello, all you beautiful people. Welcome to EdChat Interactive. My name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm your host for EdChat Interactive. Uh, tonight, we have a really interesting conversation uh, coming up with Matt Farber on Game Jams. Without much further ado, I'm going to introduce Matt Farber. His book is Gamify Your Classroom. Uh, he's a uh, social studies teacher at a middle school in New Jersey. He's an author. He's a keynoter. Uh, he's a gamer, and he's an edutopia blogger. And he runs Game Jams because because they've been so effective as uh, 21st century learning schools, learning tools. Let me stop a second and let me bring up Matt. Hey Matt, Hello. You're on. How are you? So, um, so I understand you got to go swimming with your kids this afternoon. That's play, yes, right? Uh, my, yes, took my son swimming, and um, that is play. You know, I'm in the middle of writing a dissertation, so um, I have a lot of like, you know, every time he does something, it's like, oh, that's like, you know, games with rules, like you know, Piaget or like. You know, <laughs> Some educational theories. And what's your dissertation on? What? Are what? Sorry. Out? What is your dissertation? Okay. What is your dissertation? What's the topic, or what's the title of your dissertation? No, oh, that's all top secret. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, I just it's. Uh, I won't tell time. anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just the intro web. It's uh, but it is on game based learning and um, uh. You know, I mean, the, the lit review, which I'll talk some of my some of the literature, um, has to do with uh, the um, balance of play within a game in compulsory education. It's tricky, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. we're gonna have fun today playing this game in school, and you have no choice but to play it, right? Right. Um, right. <laughs> uh, and um, so I'll talk about that a little bit, and where game jams fit in, and uh, you know. Of course, the history of game-based learning and and uh, concept of opportunity to learn. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you want me to come down now and start bringing up your your slides? Yeah, sure. Okay, all right, here we go. Oh, look at that! So there is the game jam logo. Do I just like um, do like the Milgram experiment and buzz you every time? Give you a little electric shock. To move a slide. <laughs> so, okay, so a little bit about myself. I'm a teacher. I teach at Valley View Middle School in Denville, New Jersey. Uh, okay. And uh, I, um, I have a master's degree in educational technology from New Jersey City University, and I'm a doctoral candidate in educational technology leadership. Clearly, I'm just reading off the slide here. Uh, but um, I do teach middle school social studies. I'm on the board of directors of the New Jersey Council for Social Studies. I am a um, part of the new uh, History Quest, which is from the Woodrow Wilson School, or Woodrow Wilson Foundation, I should say, in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, and they do a lot of teacher um, fellowships. And this one is new in that they're working with the Institute of Play which uh, runs the Quest to Learn School in New York City, and um, they're very active in the game community. And uh, the History Quest model does use some sort of variation of um, game design in its training, in its uh, teacher training programs. So uh, I'll touch more on that later, but um, that's a little bit on my background as a classroom practitioner. Next. Okay, there it is. There's my shameless plug for my book. Uh, this came out last January uh, because of a couple of reasons. I was blogging for Edutopia, which is a wonderful organization, a great resource for teachers, one of the uh, better ones out there. And, you know, as a teacher, I was aggregating different resources to use into my classroom. And um, in my master's degree, I used a lot of um, resources from uh, my professor and dissertation chair, Dr. Christopher Schamberg, who uh, is um, well known in the field for uh, Remix. And um, that was a fun way to bring uh, learning to students through um, digital 
uh, new literacies uh, like podcasting, digital storytelling. But as I started to get more into the game space, I realized there was uh, a lot going on, but it was very disconnected all over the place. So what I did was I curated and aggregated things that are under this book, and I got to interview about 50 different experts in the field from um, uh, people at the Cooney Center, at Sesame Workshop, uh, developers of apps and games, uh, like um, you know uh, everything from like Manga High to um, Glass Labs team and uh, Filament Games, Shell, Jesse Shell at Shell Games and, and things like that. Incidentally, I did interview Jesse Shell and I sent him a copy of my book uh, after it came out because he's in it. And he was looking at the bottom part here where my picture is and it says where I went to school. And as it turns out, he went to middle school at the very school that I teach. Uh, I was able to uh, reconnect him with um, his former computer teacher, who was my uh, former principal. And uh, they uh, chatted over the summer. Uh, we uh, met at the uh, Serious Play Conference. So kind of a small world, getting even smaller. So um, that's the book. And uh, the book is a field guide, so it's very hands-on. I, um, I was inspired by Susie Boss, who wrote a field guide to um, project-based learning. So I wanted something as utilitarian for a teacher as that was for project-based learning, but for game-based learning. Here you see my contact information, so feel free to follow me on Twitter uh, or go to my website or send me an email after this presentation if you have any questions. And all the links are on that um, link down there on the bottom, the Game Jam link. And uh, that will be in the last slide as well in case you um, didn't write it down or whichever. So what are games? There are a lot of definitions of games. And as I mentioned before, I'm writing a dissertation about game-based learning. And you know, I have a stack of games. And fortunately, the experience of writing the book has really brought me in contact with different game designers. I've uh, co-designed some interesting fiction games. And I have a, a lot of ideas about what definitions of games are. Next slide. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, so games are systems with interconnected components. This is one of many definitions of games. Um, Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman, um, they in their book Rules of Play, they define um, games as a um, um, artificial conflict with a quantifiable um, outcome. But that's not always Sometimes games don't have a quantifiable outcome and a goal. Um, for instance, if you're playing World of Warcraft for a, a half hour and then you decide that you are done for the evening doing whatever you're doing and you go off and do something else. Well, there's no goal, right? These are persistent worlds. They go on even when you're not playing. Uh, the world of Minecraft continues even though you're not logged in. Um, rules are constraints. So from a design perspective, games have um, affordances, signifiers, and constraints, which are design terms. Um, really great book on that topic is The Design of Everyday Things from Norman. And uh, constraints are there for a reason to uh, hopefully bring out some sort of fun in the game or, or some sort of um, way you can work the system of the game. Uh, digital games, you spend time learning the rules as you go, so therefore you're trying to figure out where the rules begin and end. And games have components, games have core mechanics, and games have a space. Um, there are other definitions. There's definition from Jay McGonigal, which includes feedback, and there's a lot of emphasis on instant feedback, except, of course, when there's not instant feedback. Like, if you're playing a social game, you draw something on, you know, draw something, the app, and you don't check it until the end of the workday to see what your friend did. There's not instant feedback, but there certainly is that loop there. And then the space, again, could be anything. That's the magic circle where games take place. Next, please. OK, so by the way, these slides I, I run through with my sixth and seventh grade students. Um, I use the same slides, same language as a game developer would use. Uh, because it's authentic. So, you know, we keep the conversation. Actions, they're actions of play, 
they set um, the game in motion. Games are all interconnected systems. So what games do particularly well is teach what interconnected systems are, which work great in any field that you are teaching, any discipline, if that is what the mechanic really focuses on as well. So in social studies, I've used games to teach about the Colombian exchange, which is the exchanges of goods and animals and smallpox, incidentally, the new world to the old world and the old world to the new world. Um, you know, the human body and weather have interconnected systems. Um, character webs and books are interconnected systems. Uh, so it goes on and on and on. Core mechanics are what you do over and over in a game, and uh, I like to make sure that the core mechanics match what the gameplay is. Otherwise, you get that chocolate covered broccoli effect where the, um, what happens is you are um, turning the learning into an obstacle. So if you are shooting, which is a core mechanic, and you're shooting a zombie, but to kill the zombie, you have to solve a fraction problem. You turn the fraction into an obstacle. What happens is in that uh, feedback loop, you're anticipating the affordance is blowing something up. But what happens instead is that you have to get a uh, math problem to do. And you have a mental model in your mind that you're expecting from the affordance the zombie or alien to blow up. And instead, you get this math problem, which becomes a chore. And you don't want to make learning into a chore. It could be a chore enough. Next. So how do you make this interesting to a kid? Well, that's what game jams are about. Game jams are about experience learning. Uh, game jams are about creating games. Game jams are about um, putting games into the system of a classroom, uh, not just having kids play a game, stare at screens, roll dice. Uh, the rollout of the game is very important. Coming to and around the game is very important. It's not just playing the game, but it's using all the interconnected systems of the game for a greater conversation in the classroom or the school or any other after school program. Next slide, please. So a year ago, uh, the White House hosted its first game jam. And uh, many educational game developers and designers were invited. And some of the games are previewable on the uh, YouTube channel for the White House Game Jam, which is great also because it shows the amount of support that the Department of Education has uh, for this type of event. Next slide, please. Here's a Game Jam I was uh, invited to last spring, but I wasn't able to go due to a travel conflict. But I did meet some of the uh, organizers the summer at Serious Play Conference, which was at Carnegie Mellon. They had a um, Now I Get It jam at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, these were the topics. So what you do in a game jam, which is a game within a game, you get a short amount of time. So time is a mechanic here, a resource. Here you got uh, 48 hours to work with a team to come up with a game that's fun. In this case, these were games that are um, Explorable Explanations, which is uh, like Parable of the Polygons. It's like a blog with some interactivity. So it's like a game-like text that you play with. Or Earth a Primer, which is a uh, iPad book where you can play with the text and the images. Uh, so here that you had to come up with these, and these are design constraints. Uh, for teachers, when I try to teach about, or when I do teach about game jams, I like to make the comparison to the TV show Chopped. If you haven't seen the TV show Chopped with uh, Ted Allen as the host on the Food Network, um, what happens is there are three contestants. They get a basket with certain foods, and you have to make something really good. It could be uh, you know, the appetizer, the uh, main course, or the dessert in a certain amount of time, and it has to be good, and you have to use the things in the basket, all of them. And you could also use other ingredients. So what they're doing is designing with constraints to an audience, which is the panel of judges, who then assess them with a rubric. Next slide, please. OK, so breakout. Um, this is level one. And uh, please break out into groups of two or three and try to discuss a topic, three topics, or 
three themes you cover during the school year that students could create games about. If you are not a teacher, try to think back to some of the topics when you were a student and think about that. And uh, it doesn't, when you're a teacher, you don't just think about topics themselves. There are themes. Um, in a classroom, you have um, a unit and then a lesson. At Quest to Learn, the school in, in New York that's uh, founded by the Institute of Play, they have missions, which are you know, four to six week learning trajectories with quests in between, which take one or two days. So the Revolutionary War would be a unit. Um, you know, the Battle of Valley, the, the Winter of Valley Forge would be a lesson. Right, it looks like a number of you were in were talking with each other, which is perfect. Let me bring Matt back up. Oops, sorry, I clicked the wrong button. Now let me bring Matt back up. Hey Matt. Hello. Hey, did you get a chance to talk with anybody? Any of the people in the groups? I did not. They looked also ah. engaged, so I wasn't yeah, sure they did. if I <laughs> so I didn't. You know, there's um there's uh research uh, one of my professors shared about uh, distance learning, where if you if you enter in a discussion thread, if a professor enters in a discussion board thread for a course, mm -hmm. everybody in the in the in the uh, course will stop talking. <laughs> ah, like the best, okay. Uh, best buzzkill for a conversation. <laughs> so I'm hoping that at least one person now will raise their hands and be willing to talk with you up here. And if not, then I'm going to arbitrarily pick somebody. But let's see if uh, let's see if somebody raises their hands, in which case I'll bring them up. Uh, I don't see anybody. Okay, we'll be, ah, there goes somebody right there. Okay, um, so I'm going to come down and I'm going to bring up our lucky contestant number one, uh, Garrett Zimmer. One second. All right. I thought I should bite the bullet. Hiya, Matt. Hi, Garrett. Nice to see you. Thanks. If this is face to face, <laughs> it's close enough. I think it's about as close as we can get without uh, being in the same room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, your show, my friend. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so, um, what did what did you guys come up with as a theme to make a game about? I'll, I'll, I'll have to apologize on behalf of the, the group that we were having the discussion with. Uh, the majority of us are, are not actually in a teaching field right now. So we kind of uh -huh. led into a, a different discussion in terms of sort of what, what we're thinking of doing with, uh, with gamification and game-based learning. Um, sure. And I think it, it was Kim who was just finalizing her explanation on what she's intending on doing and some of the challenges. Uh, so we didn't come up with an actual theme, but we did come up with a couple of uh, ideas that I think you might be able to help us sort of clarify. Sure, that'd be great. Yeah. So Kim was Kim is in charge uh, or, or works with a number of different schools. And one of the challenges that she's been finding, and I'm seeing the same thing, is in the research on game-based learning. There is some hesitancy in gamification and game research on how do you prove that there's results? How do you prove that we're meeting the academic standards and that the test scores are going to actually improve out of that? For curveball games? question? No, it's not a curveball question. Not at all. Uh, you mean from, the, from playing the games or from making the games? From developing your, your school into sort of a game-based learning environment or your classroom into a game-based learning environment, um, how, do you, how do you make sure that you're getting those results? And I think maybe that ties into sort of the, the themes that you're talking about, maybe an example of a, a theme that you think fit really, really well, and then how do you get the results sure. out of it? That's, that's the question that I kind of took out of that conversation. Sure. Well, well you know, um, we're, we're at a time here where you've got con conflicting things, right? You've got standardized test scores, right? And then you've got... Um, Results, uh, you know, for, you know, student results.
so I think we might have uh, I might have broken him. Bitch. I broke him. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep, I'm I'm coming back up because it was a good question and I think that that um uh Matt's connection may have gone down, uh, even though I'm clicking on it now, and I, um, and his hand is going up. But um, let, let me just let me just text him, um, just to see if he's able to hear, and just tell him that he froze. Um, so he may. Because it's interesting because I'm even clicking on him and nothing. I, I'm not. Act, I'm not actually able to have him come back up for right now. So he may have to reboot. But um, and he didn't respond to my IM either. So let me just. So your question. Uh, while while I'm still fiddling with trying to get uh, poor Matt to come to to come back up. So your your question was how do we know what does the research say or how do we know that students are really learning through games, right? Yeah, um, through games, so, through gamification, through uh, you know, a game jams, these types of things. Like you can you can build a game, and it's right. easy to see that you know, as a kid is going through understanding what is the learning metric they're trying to put into this game, they're gonna mm -hmm. get lots of value out of it. But how do you quantify right. it? How do you prove it? And how do you then? prove it to the administrators who are going to say yay or nay, this is something we want to do. So, so, um, so there, is a, there is some research on games, and one of, one of the difficulties is, is and, and even on, on building games, one of the difficulties is that it's hard, to, it's, the, the research does, finds that it's very difficult to quantify a specific skill that students have learned. So if you, if you have a game that's designed to teach a particular um, standard, you know, a Common Core standard or a Next Generation Science standard, or or, or something like that. Um, that's that's a little bit more difficult to quantify. But they have given tests about, say, 21st century skills, and it looks like Matt is back. Um, so they have given, uh, they have been able to to quantify that students are better able to problem solve, they are be better able to collaborate, and they are better able to plan as they do things like game jams or um, or a variety of games. But but it's less, there's, there's more of a tenuous connection between specific uh, common core standards. On the other hand, there's there's starting to be some studies that, that are that are starting to show that, but um, but some of those studies aren't aren't published yet, and so uh, I think you're going to be seeing those in the next couple of years. But I'm going to throw it back and say, where was the data that showed that textbooks teach effectively? Right. You know, there really was never data for that either. I'm going to now bring myself down, and I'll bring Matt back up, hopefully. Uh, if he doesn't come back up, then 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 I'll, um, you know, then I'll. I think he will. And I'll I'll throw this kind of point. This is just a theory. And Matt, please, you know, the, the spike ball this theory out of the water if you'd like. Um, but I think a lot of it as well, from my experience, has to do with the design of the game. It has to do with the design of the game jam or the game-based learning environment. And if it's designed to capture those particular learning outcomes, it should be a lot easier to capture and improve them. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I didn't hear everything Mitch said, so I, I can speak a little bit about learning outcomes. There. Um, I'm just scrolling here through some of my research. Um, I okay, thought I had so, you, by the way. I'm sorry. What's that? I thought I had broken you. No, no, <laughs> no. I, I have I have about forty one pages of research on this from my literature review. So <laughs> quite the opposite. You like uh, tapped a well here. Uh, nice. In fact, Elizabeth King, uh, who is um, out of the University of Wisconsin, uh, not the Madison one, but I forgot which one she's at. But uh, her dissertation was on uh, game based learning. Uh, it had to do with boys playing games. But in her lit review, she covered very nicely about 
where game-based learning uh, meets the framework for 21st century skills. Uh, and there's a very, very comfortable alignment with games and 21st century skills, which is collaboration, innovative problem solving, uh, systems thinking, design thinking. Those are career skills. Those are workforce skills that are in demand. And uh, I live in New Jersey as one of the 13 states that subscribes to the P21 framework. Regarding Common Core uh, skills, Common Core is, um, does not di dictate pedagogy. It doesn't say how you should teach. It just says what should be teach taught. Uh, for teachers, teacher evaluation models, it's not just learning, learning goals or learning objectives. There's something called value-added models, which is very controversial because you're still asking students to grow and where are they growing, from one year to another? By the time I get standardized test scores back, my students from seventh grade are not even in my grade level and I don't even see them, right? Uh, so there's, there's a combination of things that teachers are evaluated on. And really, when you peel all the layers of the onion off, it comes down to something called OTL, which is opportunity to learn. Opportunity to learn means that the teacher's role is to make sure that students, all students, whether they have um, special education needs, or whether they are general education, whether they are English language learners, that they all have an opportunity to get to the curriculum. The teacher facilitates that um, getting to the curriculum. Where games uh, fit into that paradigm is that games provide experiential learning. There's a really great quote Jim G said in a uh, interview for um, uh, the connected learning, digital media learning community about two or three years ago about opportunity to learn. And um, games have that potential, but that's if everybody has the game. And this is different than an achievement gap. This is the opportunity gap. So everybody gets the opportunity. Games, if everybody's playing the game, you would have that uh, adaptive learning. Like uh, if you're playing, I don't know, Argubot Academy from Glass Lab, every child playing through the uh, application would learn claims-based argumentation at the level right and then the data is aggregated the growth which plays well also into the uh, trend of the growth mindset um, you know when you're persevering more in a short term than you would in a long term like grit right um, so one thing that Jim G mentioned is that if you have a student that's reading learning about physics in a classroom or they're learning about physics from a book or any other multimodal means if that's fine, but if another student's doing the same thing and then going home and playing portal for hours and hours and experiencing what velocity is and what gravity is and that sort of thing, the experiential learning is really going to be affecting that child. And the, that's the opportunity gap where one child doesn't have that opportunity at home. Or maybe both of them have video game systems at home and one has a, a new media bias that's existing at home, that games are not as good media as books or as film just because they're not as around as longer but they can still offer a deeper engagement mm -hmm. uh, it, to build off of research there is a mound of research on project-based learning going back you know decades and game-based learning especially game jams fit well in a context of project-based learning where you have centers around the class where students are making projects but in this case the projects they're making are interactive games, they're systems that they're working with. And it's an authentic real world skill, but if it situates nicely in the context of game uh, project-based learning, which a lot of schools do adhere to. You know, there's the schooling that we all remember, and there's the schooling that's on TV, which is similar to what we all remember, and there's what actually goes on in school. Um, you know, many schools um, are, or attempt to be uh, student-centered, as do um, you know pre-service teaching. You know, pre-service teachers are not generally taught to uh, deliver sit and get. That still exists. It still goes on. But you know, as we transition from away from that, games really have a nice opportunity to um, to fit into that system. So I think Mitch wants me to go back to my slides. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, you definitely did thoroughly. Thank you so much. That was uh, very informative. Oh, you're welcome.
Okay, so actually, do you want to go on to the slides, or or do you want to continue? I, do. I, I okay, all right. I'll bring I'll come I, bring myself down. I do oh, go ahead. Do you have a question? Because of the pictures. Okay. Yeah. Uh, these slides have a lot of images from game jams, uh, student-centered game jams. So I think that that's meaningful. I, I actually put a lot of slides together, but they're not all intended to be talking points. Some of them are visuals. And uh, I promise they won't be boring. It's not my vacation photos. <laughs> Pictures of uh, Mitch and I at um, you know the Serious Play Conference in Pittsburgh. This is a, a wonderful resource, um, which I think everybody needs to do. This is a uh, Google Doc. It's uh, from Kevin Miklosh and some others uh, involved, but he's my contact with, with this project. He is uh, head of assessment uh, or one of the directors of assessment at Brain Pop. He was iridescent. Uh, and this is a project called the Movable Game Jam, which went to uh, about a dozen after school programs in New York City last year, including Quest to Learn, the Museum of the Moving Image, and many other after-school locations. And uh, the Institute of Play and Hive, which is an after-school slide, please. Next. OK, so here's the image of um, the game jam, the promotional material. Again, you can use any games here. Next. We'll just go quickly on these sticker. <laughs> Next. These are children playing. Now, what's wonderful about this is none of these kids knew each other at the beginning. But by the end of the day, they all knew each other. So it's a really great way. I find playing games, even beta testing games at the beginning of the year, a wonderful way to get All right, it looks like uh, like Matt's connection may have gone down again. Oh, that, no, he's back. Um, so I'll bring myself back down and let me bring Matt back up. This is at me. We can go to the other slides right after this. But I'll be really brief. Um, the uh, game jams I've done in my school is a school for low incentive disabled students. I ran a game jam school wide here um, about a month ago and it's uh, now part of the game jam document. Uh, all the teachers, the principal, the um, aides were all in this particular school and this school is a school for um, uh, severely cognitively and physically disabled students. And um, what this served to be was an excellent um, professional development experience as well for teachers who have never considered using games. Uh, the theme here was play. This is from the Institute of Playing Play and Everyday Objects, where you know a cup isn't just a cup. It could be a hat, it could be a telephone in your ear, that sort of thing. So all the children were playing, and it was very tactile based. Uh, we used Makey Makey. I ran this room uh, with bananas, as keyboards, um, and um, you know, Play-Doh. Uh, to create game controllers, and it was very hands-on. Uh, most of the children that I spoke to have never even considered the fact that you could hack into a keyboard and um, create something else to make games with. And, uh, you know, bananas, again, playability of objects. Normally, you don't think of bananas as toys, unless you're, you know, a young child and you're still in that symbolic stage of gameplay. Uh, if we could pause in this slide for a second, this girl came in and she said, well, this is really awkward. Um, she had physical, she has physical disabilities. Um, she, I, I don't know her background, but, uh, you know, cognitively, she was, uh, she was very sharp to uh, criticize that using bananas is just, quote, awkward. Why are we doing this? And uh, I said, well, you know, you can make your own game controller. And in about 10 minutes, she played out. Uh, and she took a big piece of paper and she uh, plugged in the alligator clips and she was playing Pac-Man. 
And um, she really had a strong sense of pride and ownership. And when she left the session, she just looked at me and she said, this was cool. So, you know, it's really empowering, the, uh, the idea that you can play with and go around things, not just stare at screens and uh, play games, but like come at the games different ways. Next slide, please. Uh, here's another girl playing Compose Yourself, which is a, a fun game from Think Fun, which is a, a really great um, uh, educational or, uh, I don't know, um, I don't like to just say educational, but they're board games and digital games kind of mixed together. So here's one where you make music, and Compose Yourself is a very fun way to do that. And Sphero, uh, they were able to make obstacle courses using the robotic ball. Now, this was also done at Quest to Learn. At Quest to Learn, the kids did not want to do the obstacle course. They just wanted to play with the robot ball, controlling with the iPad. Now, here's the tension between play and game. You know, you play within a game. Not all games are play. Uh, in a classroom, you want to make sure that there's enough room to play because the zone of proximal development, which is where Vygotsky, Lev Vygotsky, the um, educational psychologist in the early 20th century, uh, he theorized that that's where play happens. In play, he said, a child is a head taller than himself. You really extend yourself and play. You try things you wouldn't ordinarily try. Without play, without a sense of play or freedom to play, too many structures that are involved, you're not going to really get at the learning you want to get. And again, there's a century of sound educational research to back this up. Or you can look at Minecraft or you know the Sackboy community in Little Big Planet to see how self-directed and self-initiated play trumps um, overly structured play. Next slide. So this is a game jam center in my classroom. So again, it situates nice in a project-based learning setting. So here students can, um, they are designers, they make games. And the only difference is, unlike a project where let's say you make a scrapbook and here you have a different gap, an opportunity gap, you have, um, you know, the gap of who has more money to spend at Michael's or Walmart buying fancy scrapbook materials, and who doesn't, who's just going to use a class given glue sticks and construction paper and hand in a scrapbook. In a game jam, you don't hand in a finished product. You've handed an iteration of a product. So the students get a constraint, a design goal, like make a fun board game about the Revolutionary War battles in two class periods and then play test in other groups, get feedback, iterate on your game, and hand in all the artifacts. The game doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to be playable. It doesn't have to go on Kickstarter tomorrow. Uh, what you're grading here is the artifacts, and that's a design thinking that's part of the 21st century framework, and um, I think we can uh, move on to the next slide so we can get to the um, next topic. And here's design thinking. Uh, next top slide, please. Okay, so here's an example of student work. They made a Revolutionary War game using uh, red erasers for red coats and blue erasers for, um, for the American colonists. Next slide, please. Here are the rules. Oh, by the way, uh, reading and writing informational and text is common core assessment writing. So just writing the rules of a game in a game jam and then playing somebody else's rules uh, is a common core linked um, requirement for English language arts right out of the gates, as well as 21st century skill of user empathy. Next slide. And then, of course, there are a lot of free applications for this, like making trading cards. Next. Student work of making trading cards into a game from that app. And uh, this breakout here. So, if you want to make that larger, but what I'd like you to do is to think of a game using dystopian fiction, because this is very popular in school, dystopian fiction, which is, um, could be anywhere. I gave a little some starters there. So, you know, you have the Hunger Games, and you have um, where anything has really basically complete control over something else. How would you modify an existing board or car game to make something dystopian, where the government has all the control?
All right, I know it's a little bit early. Uh, I said I'd give you till 7.59, and it's only 7.58 Eastern time. Uh, tough. Uh, we set the rules. Um, you can set the rules in your own classes. Uh, so, uh, you know, I had a question, Matt. So y y the slide that was up said choose a game that would teach about dystopia. Why did, why did you choose dystopia? Go ahead. Well, I chose dystopia because dystopia is very popular for young adult fiction. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Yes, can I me? can hear you. Yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Um, dystopia is popular for young adult fiction because of the fact that um, you know, they're usually told what to do, right? So it kind of strikes a nerve there with children. Uh, and it's, it's a theme that's, again, not new to, to teaching. Uh, you know, we when we teach about the Declaration of Independence, and this is even before I started teaching, it's always the, the, the child getting angry at the parent, which is the colonies getting angry at the mother country. And, you know, these are game-like elements that go on and throughout different topics and subjects. So if you were told, okay, pick a card game and use it to teach about dystopia, what's a card game that you might use? Um, a card game that I might choose uh, would be um, that's a that is a good question. <laughs> I have so uh, many different. Okay, card games all right. Or head. board game. What's a board game that you might choose? Well, no, we could do a simple card game. Let's say you take Sushi Go, right? Sushi Go is this new simple little game from a uh, um, it's a game card game from uh, Game Right, and you basically mm -hmm. have to build sushi rolls as you go, right? And you have to match mm -hmm. them up, and it's uh, it's a card drafting game, very light, fun, ten dollars, and uh, to make it. Dystopian, you could put somebody in charge. You could uh, make very restrictive rules. You could make it so um, you know you're always being watched. There are a lot of different angles you can go with a dystopia like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's um, it's 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 interesting in that regard that um, you're experiencing what dystopia is. You're not just hearing about what dystopia is, and that's what games can do really well. They can really put you in these experiences. Mm -hmm. Have you tried this exercise with students yet, having them develop a game to teach about dystopia? Um, I have not about dystopia, but I do intend on doing it this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I also ordered a whole bunch of different um, non digital games to complement my classroom, like The Resistance, which is a card game that you can play mm -hmm. with a lot of people, and um, Coup, which is in the world of Resistance. And, uh, you know, again, I could teach about the Revolutionary War just by using a parallel concept. And again, it works great in project-based learning. So you could have a quarter of the class playing resistance in one station, another station doing something uh, maybe about brain pop that has to do with the Revolutionary War, and then you know two stations on other topics, let's say. Mm -hmm. And you know they move around every day or so, and then you know it's all threaded together. Yep. So I'm going to wondering if there's anybody, I know we're a little bit past the hour here, I'm wondering if there's anybody who can raise their hand who's willing to come up here and describe a game that they propose to teach about dystopia. And go ahead, you, and the, rate, the way you raise your hand is you bring your cursor over your avatar and then one of the options is to raise your hand. Um, if you're a little shy and you want, ah, there goes somebody right there. Uh, good. Okay. I'm going to bring myself down and bring her up. One second. Hi. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Um, I was actually I was talking to Garrett. Um, one of the ways I thought of was a board game. I don't know. I'm going to show my age, but the game of life where you had a little car and you would you would spin the spinner and you move and things happen to you along the journey to the end. Like right. you get kids right. or you get married. So, um, we would look at that. We actually played a simulation of this game with a math class. Um, they had careers and they, they had to draw out of a jar and they got married or they got divorced or they, they got a master's degree or they didn't and they wound up working at McDonald's and they had to adjust their budgets in, it was financial literacy, they had to adjust their budgets and how they were going to pay their bills and all of that with that. But for Dysia, I would say you could just 
change out those cards that they draw when they land on the blue square or they have to draw here. And you could say, um, for example, in this dystopian society, you're only allowed to have two children. You have three. You now have to pick one to get rid of, sort of a Sophie's Choice kind of thing, and make them decide how they're going to do that and have those conversations as part of the game. And if you get rid of you know, if you choose to get rid of your child, move ahead two. If you choose to rebel, go back five. Or you know, so they eventually have to work their way through the game. But having that concept that the decisions are not made by you, but you, how you react to them is, so you can choose that. And tying that into literature, you could have a lay Mis game. You could talk about the French Revolution and the the sort of things that were happening to people at that time, and let the kids have those conversations before they move forward or back. That's great. Um, that's Guillotine comes yeah. to mind for the uh, French yes. Revolution. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking. Yeah, little. You can have cake, or you can have your head cut off. Yeah. You know, pick your choice. And uh, there's also Spent. I don't know if you've ever played Spent. It's a, a free interactive fiction game. You just Google Spent okay. game. Um, it's it's also um, it, you you have a limited amount of resources, and you have to go basically through the healthcare system and figure ah. out like, you know, how that works. Okay. So, see, and these are all really great elements that tie something together in a project-based setting. So again, like you said, you can do the life mod in one section. Spent scene, and then you know maybe something about you know a video quest activity about the French Revolution, and then everything gets all tied together, and you know it's all of these different. It's not just the experiences; it's being multimodal also, right? So you know you have all the different um, learning types being put at. That's wonderful. Yeah, great. That was that that, that was interesting, and, and it's funny as you bring up. I mean, can you think of anything more dystopian than the U.S. healthcare system? <laughs> you well, can really model dystopia on that. Byzantine, probably that's a better term. That's a better term. So it's now uh, five after the hour. Uh, do you have any? What, what what would be the two things, or maybe let's say three things? What are the three things that you would want people most to get out of today? Um, well, the first thing I would like people to get out of is that game jams. Um, People want to do, uh, I've been approached a lot by teachers right, who want to, uh, you know, I wrote the book, you know, Game of Fire Classroom, right? They want to do that in the classroom. And, you know, there's certainly the, the want for that, right? And there's no magic bullet. There's no, there's no like, this is one great thing this is going to do, or this is the, the app or the, or the platform, uh, you know, that's gamified and everything's going to be perfect. The closest I've seen to that is a game jam where you're using good teaching practice that's already been out there project-based learning, and you are using games in that setting. Uh, that right. is very meaningful to students. Um, mixing in, another thing is mixing digital and non-digital and matching up the core mechanics with the learning goals and um, you know the teacher facilitating that all together. And then, of course, the third thing to keep in mind, and this is hard for students, because uh, I remember a student came up to me and she said, you forward do you expect how do you expect us to make a, a fun game about the Revolutionary War in just over 45 minutes and I, I was like no I'm not expecting you to do that you know um, the last couple of slides uh, which takes like two seconds all that is is um, the uh, the uh, feedback form and parts of a game that students can... I'll come down and I'll, and I'll bring oh, yeah. that up okay what I collect is the artifacts. I don't collect uh, finished games, perfect games. You know, maybe one or two, two are pretty good versions, like the one I showed before. But uh, this is from the Institute of Ga uh, Q Game Design Pack. So students get this on one side. They have to fill this out. Uh, so and they have a good point of reference. Nobody's had any problems understanding the difference of a challenge or a core mechanic when they see a rock, paper, scissors right next to it. And then next slide. Then they have to play test another group's game, and they fill this out, and they offer feedback. And um, you know, play testing is great. My son's four. He got a toy from uh, a fast food restaurant, and he starts explaining why it's not fun. You know, this isn't fun because it doesn't come apart and it doesn't do this. Just the actual, you know, explaining why is, is wonderful. And you know, if you're looking for some sort of common core skill, it is uh, part of uh, evidence claimed argumentation. And we don't have time for this, obviously, but here again is uh, my contact information. All 
Okay, well, thank you. And the name of your book again? Oh, uh, Game of Fire Classroom, A Field Guide to Game-Based Learning. Um, it is not a gamification book, per se. There's about a half of a chapter about what gamification is and how to do well and quest-based models and that sort of thing. But it's mainly mm -hmm. uh, a tour, a field guide about what is happening in game-based learning. And okay. How to now, if, every, if everything goes right, uh, we'll have recorded mm -hmm. this. Um, and we'll be able to post the recording up online. But whether or not we the recording actually worked, uh, we will have the slides up on our on our archive pages on our website uh, certainly by Monday of next week, and, and hopefully before then. So, uh, Matt, uh, thank you, thank you, thanks for appearing. Thank you, and uh, uh, happy birthday one day late. <laughs> well, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, at at um, when I was. 50, I decided, you know something, this is ridiculous, Let's start going backwards. So this was my 38th birthday, um, and uh, so thank you very much. Um, Benjamin. So, <laughs> so, uh, so any, anyhow, thank you. I hope, uh, hope we get to do this again um, sometime in the fall, and um, I'll, I'll sign off for EdChat Interactive. My name is Mitch Weisberg, and I hope that you all come to additional EdChat interactives and have a chance to interact with some great people doing some some really interesting things. Uh, we have one we have two so far coming up in September. We're about to, to schedule two more. So um, signing off for this evening, Mitch Weisberg for EdChat Interactive. Thanks again, Matt, and thank you all for coming. I hope you found this very informative. Take care.